I was, I was thinking though, I've, I've been, I've been saved 23 years and I, I don't know if I've ever actually heard, uh, preaching on the actual new birth other than, uh, just a, a compelling for someone, uh, to be born again. But as far as the operation of God, uh, and, and really, I guess the, the doctrinal emphasis of what it means to be, to be born again. And so I've, I've enjoyed this. I hope you have. I hope it has uh, been enlightening, uh, to us who have been born again. And, uh, and so, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it and looking forward to tonight's message as well. I, I titled this evening, evening's message, How Can I Be Saved? And th- I mean, obviously that is like, the premier question that needs to be answered. That would be the question on the, the heart and from the lips of the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. Sirs, what must I do uh, to be saved? But if we were to broaden that out tonight and to, to look at what, what I would say in the overall structure uh, of what it means to be saved, uh, what is it that initially brings about a person's ultimate salvation? Uh, what is it that enables a person to actually repent of their sins and to actually have faith and to be able to exercise that faith in the Lord savingly, or if you will, sincerely, and have God uh, forgive that person of all their transgressions to forgive that person of even uh, the notion of a sin nature, uh, to have God adopt us into His family, accept us in the Beloved, and justify us in the courtroom of heaven, and and all of those other great features of our salvation. What, What is it that actually begins the simultaneous process, if I could say it like that? And we would have to say tonight from the Scriptures... It is our being born again, or if you will, our being raised from uh, the dead. And so I hope that has uh, maybe cleared up some of uh, the generalizations of preaching in our day and age that just calls men to be born again as if they could do anything to merit or to bring about their own new birth. And, And you would have as much to do with your being born again as you had to do with your being born the first time. It is the operation of God. I was, I was actually thinking, I'm going to get all this in before my time starts for my message, okay? Uh, I, I don't know why, but I was, I was thinking at some point, I can't remember when it was, but just this morning throughout the service, I hope I wasn't doing it while I was preaching. Uh, but uh, if so, I, I, please don't hold me accountable for what I may have said while my mind was wondering while I was talking. Uh, but I, I don't know the, the verse uh, in the book of Corinthians where, I, I believe it's in Corinthians, uh, where the, the Bible says, it, it may be um, maybe in the book of Romans, uh, where the Bible speaks of uh, the goodness of God leading us to repentance, leading a person to repentance. And uh, there, there's, there's so much of a, a misunderstanding of what that, that means. I, I really believe it may have been in the prayer room when I was, I was thinking that. Uh, the, the goodness of God that leads a person to repentance isn't the prosperity that God brings about in a person's life that brings about like, like God's going to let you win the lottery as He's working on you to be saved. Uh, now, if God does let you win the lottery, God bless you, and we have some tithe envelopes that we'd love to pass out to you. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the goodness of God that leads a person or brings a person to repentance is, it, that means this, okay? It means that repentance is a gift of the goodness of God. God grants repentance unto life. You, you understand, every part of your salvation experience has been enabled and, and even supplied to you by the power of God. You wouldn't have repented if God didn't enable you to repent, you wouldn't have believed unless God enabled you to believe. Now, uh, what, what is the relationship of the believer to repentance? Does the believer legitimately repent? Sure he does, but only as he is enabled to do so. And does the believer actually exercise faith if God gives to him the faith whereby 
uh, he exercises that faith. Sure, he, he is responsible to do so, and he does actually do so, but he never would have done so had God not enabled him to do that. And so all of that enabling power uh, comes from the, the experience of being born again. Okay, so that's my explanation as we jump in to tonight's message. Okay, John chapter 3, and let's pick up a reading, verse 9, and we want to read down through verse number 15, okay? So, so here's this conversation Nicodemus and Jesus are having together. Uh, verse number 9, Nicodemus answers Christ, uh, that is, he responds to Christ and said unto him, How can these things be? Uh, in relationship to being born again. How, how can this actually happen? The wind blows where it listeth. You hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where, it, where it's coming from, nor where it is going. So is everyone that is born of uh, the Spirit. Nicodemus is attempting to wrap his head around these analogous truths and is just not able to grasp it. How can these things be? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? I love the sarcasm. Okay. It's Baptist doctrine. (laughs) Are you a master in Israel? And, And verse number 10, Knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, Here's, here's the indication of Nicodemus's yet unregenerate heart. If, if I told you earthly things and you will not believe or you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray together tonight. Again, God, thank You for this incredible privilege that we have to be able to meet together and learn more about Your Word. Thank You for this crowd of believers that You've put in this place tonight. And I believe with all of my heart that, that everything that has gone into our life has prepared us even for the, uh, a meeting together like this tonight. All of the previous uh, acquiring of Bible knowledge and our, our experiences and what we have seen and heard and all, all of those things. I think you have prepared us through our lives to be able to receive your word tonight. So help us illuminate our minds. Teach us by your spirit these truths that are connected in the answer to the question, how can I or how could anyone ever come to be saved? Help us tonight is our prayer. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Okay, so tonight, uh, we're, we're just going to kind of jump head first uh, inside our text because we do have somewhat of a, of a larger text uh, to uh, to deal with this evening, and so forgive me for not playing nice in the uh, in the introductions. I think uh, our labor over the last several weeks has kind of introduced the text well enough for us. We're familiar with Nicodemus, how religious of a man that he really was, how clean of a life or holy, uh, practical holiness, how holy of a life that he had actually lived. And uh, we, we've looked at the uh, different the, the, the variances of the new birth uh, as far as Judaism was actually concerned and all those kinds of things. And so we come to verse number 9 for our first heading, and what we see in verse number 9 is the perplexity. And, and you see it just, just plain and simple in Nicodemus's response to everything that Jesus has unveiled to him. Jesus has began speaking to Nicodemus back inside of verse number 3 in response to Nicodemus's affirmation of, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things except God be with him. And so Jesus answered, remember, back in verse number 3, and simply says to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus goes right for the heart of the man. Matter, the crux of the matter. He knows uh, the questions that are on Nicodemus's heart. He knows the, the inquisition that he is having within himself. And so Jesus has began this conversation and he carries that conversation through verse number 8 and Nicodemus's response to everything that Jesus has unfolded before him is how can this 
be? How, how is this even a, a possibility? I, I, I don't, I, I, the language here is, I, I don't, uh, I don't understand. I cannot wrap my head uh, around exactly what it is that you are saying to me. Okay, so the expression, how can these things be? This is language of shock and, and really disbelief. Uh, disbelief in, in this sense, okay? Disbelief in the sense of, I cannot believe you are telling me that I am not good enough. How can this be that, that you're telling me a master in Israel, a, a man with my credentials and my experiences, that, that I have to have some other religious activity in my life to be deemed good enough to enter into this kingdom of God? You can almost hear the, the note of frustration uh, from the mouth of Nicodemus uh, there inside of verse number 9. And his language really is reminiscent. I thought about this uh, this past week. Uh, his language really is reminiscent of Sarah. If you'll remember back in Genesis 18, I have the passage uh, here marked for us tonight. Uh, Sarah is going to receive the news that as she is an elderly lady, that she is going to give birth to her firstborn son. I, I, that's like an early Christmas present, you know, like, wow, you know, you're 90, you're going to be 90 years old and, and have a child. And so Genesis 18 and verse number 10, uh, he said, uh, the, the angel, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard him, uh, or heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abram and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And there's the statement in verse number 12. She's saying in similar language to Nicodemus, How can this be? Uh, you have to, I am in utter disbelief. By the way, uh, that, that is the angel's indictment against uh, against uh, Sarah there in Genesis 18 is that she has now operated in the realm of disbelief or if you will, unbelief. She is willingly uh, rejecting the information because it just doesn't make sense to her. Very much of the same here for Nicodemus in John chapter 3. It just doesn't make sense to him. And so again, it's language of shock, language of disbelief, but it's, it's indicative of, of legitimate unbelief. He just isn't ready to affirm what Jesus is actually saying to him. So Nicodemus is shocked to be told that with all of his religious accomplishments that he still cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It does not make sense to him. I want to read uh, a verse of Scripture to you that, that I believe we have used uh, probably every Sunday evening. Uh, but I want to read it to you at length just one more time so that maybe it will make sense to us why those things didn't make sense to Nicodemus. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. We see 1 Corinthians 2.14 coming out in live action in John chapter number 3. Uh, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus about the Spirit's operation in the heart of a sinner. He is speaking of the Spirit of God. He is speaking of spiritual matters. And Nicodemus, as a natural man, is not receiving that information. In fact, verse number 12, uh, or verse number 11, Jesus says, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Uh, Nicodemus, you are not receiving what I am telling you. Well, why is Nicodemus not doing it? Is it because he was religiously inferior? Is it because he didn't have a good handle on the Hebrew Scriptures? Is it because he hasn't been a good Jewish boy and went to the synagogue school all of his life? No, none of that 
is true. Uh, here again is one of the most religious men in all of Israel at this time, and yet he is naturally minded. And therefore he cannot receive the teaching uh, of the Spirit of God. Uh, they are foolishness or that, that, uh, that, Mere doctrine is foolishness unto him. He cannot understand, he cannot know it, simply because they are spiritually discerned truths. And Nicodemus, ever, however uh, religious he was, was spiritually dead inside and therefore had no capacity to understand what Jesus was saying. So he's, there's a perplexity here, okay? Now look, look with me uh, following on in verse number 10. Jesus answers and says unto him, now, I, I don't know how this, how this actually plays out, okay? And I don't think Hollywood should attempt to capture this in movie or episode form. Uh, but, but I, I do enjoy my imagination, uh, sometimes. And, and I've just, I've just kind of got in the back of my head. Now, if you, if you know something more than me, just let me, let me enjoy my ignorance, okay? Uh, but, but I've just kind of got in my mind that Jesus looks at him. I, I would love for him to, like do one of those. You, you ever watch uh, mimes? You, you, you ever watch? You know the, the the folks that they just you know like you know I, I can't do it. You know like they don't talk. You, you know y'all are acting like you don't know because you want to see me do it. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not going to go any further with it. Okay, uh, but uh, but you got the and, and I love to see them. They get excited. You know they're like they're like you know kind of like and I would love I would love to just think that's how Jesus looks at uh, at Nicodemus here. He's like oh. <laughs> Are you a master in Israel and you don't know these things? Ooh, you know, uh, I, I'm sure it wasn't probably to that level, but you know, I, I would enjoy it if it was uh, to that level. Uh, level. So Jesus is kind of playing the same game here, here with Nicodemus. Are you a master in Israel and you still don't get this? Like you have devoted your life to reading, understanding, and teaching the old Old Testament scriptures, and you still can't even begin to understand what I'm saying to you. Which raises a question for us. Is the doctrine of the new birth ever taught in the Old Testament? And I would say, yes, yeah, sure, sure it is. Not, not in clear form. It's like the doctrine of the Trinity and so many other doctrines. There's an obscurity to it, but, but it is in, in a, in a, a, a formative sense. It, it, it is actually taught in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, so many doctrines, especially the doctrine of the new birth. In fact, I would argue that one of the earliest mentionings of the notion and the nature of what it must mean to be born again takes place all the way back under the ministry of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse number 6 where, where Moses instructs the nation of Israel that the Lord thy God will circumcise your hearts. Um, what does it mean to have a circumcised heart? Well, what does it mean as far as circumcision in general? Circumcision is the practice of cutting off the male foreskin uh, on the eighth day in the religion of Judaism. It is a cutting away, the discarding of. And so in the very same way, the outer layer of the spiritual heart will need to be removed in order to uh, enable a person uh, to obey the Word of God or the commandments of God. And so Moses is saying, in the future, God is going to circumcise your hearts. Now, now we know, in hindsight, God never does that in an Old Testament dispensation. He, he never equips the believer in a similar sense or the same way that He does the New Testament believer. Uh, there, there's actually... A heavier, uh, folks argue, is there law in the New Testament? Is there law under grace? And you have this branch of antinomians who, uh, they, they want no rules associated with Christian living. They're libertines in the sense that, you know, it's a free for all and I should be able to do whatever I want to do. D did you know that, that, that the law up underneath grace, yes, there is a law. We are not without law, the Bible says. Uh, we, are, we are not under the Mosaic law, but we are under law, the law of Christ or the law of Messiah. And, and did you know the law under grace is actually heavier than the law of Moses? In, in the law of Moses, it was just uh, don't commit adultery. But the law of Messiah says if you look with lust, you've already committed adultery. The law of Moses said, uh, don't murder, don't, don't, don't kill. Uh, but the law of Messiah says, if, uh, if you have hatred in your heart to someone, then you are a murderer in your heart. And so th there is this, this, uh, 
this weightiness of a, of a matter of what it means to be a New Testament believer, and yet also to equal the rigors uh, of, the, of the life of the New Testament believer, God has circumcised the heart of the believer. He has, he has cut off, He has brought about a newness of life where He has rendered the old man to be dead indeed unto sin, but the new man, the new birth, is, is alive unto God, which gives us this operation in the believer that allows us to live lives that are in compliance to the Lord. Nicodemus just couldn't, he couldn't even understand in, in its, in its premature form what Moses and so many of the prophets actually alluded to by, by virtue of this new work that God was going to be accomplishing in the life of the believer. Okay. So, so the perplexity kind of continues here, verses 11 and verse number 12. Nicodemus is not receiving Jesus' teaching. We find that out at the end of verse number 11. The idea of, of the word receive here, uh, lambenu, is to take hold of something or to place something in one's hands. Nicodemus can't get his hands wrapped around what Jesus is actually saying. Now, this is not so much just a lack of faith uh, as it is a failure to actually lay hold of or believe what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not teaching Nicodemus, you need to go back to Hebrew Bible college, okay? He is not saying you need more intellectual facts so you can grasp this in a, in a scientific faith. Uh, uh, relationship, okay? Uh, no, no, w w what this new birth is, or, or the understanding of the new birth, is simply a compliance with and a, and a, and a grabbing hold uh, of what Jesus is saying, even though I may not understand all of the implications of that. Nicodemus is not prepared to turn his back on everything that he has previously known and to just I believe at face value what Jesus is saying. Can I just insert something here, just real quick? Like, I, I believe, uh, personally, I, I think I have some, some, some loose, uh, interpretive kind of ideas from the Bible concerning this, but I, I would base this more so on my own experience, and, 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 and that's this, okay? Uh, that it is, it is so much easier, uh, to, to interact with someone who is not a Christian, to present the gospel to them and have that person just, just take hold of the gospel, believe it, and obey it in their hearts, uh, just at face value. It's easier for that to take place than it is to take someone who has been raised with false notions and, and has believed a a perverted or a distorted gospel message to take that person and get them to discard all of that and just take the Word of God at face value. Well, that's the case of Jesus with Nicodemus. Jesus is now calling upon Nicodemus to throw away everything that he has learned over the last 50 plus years of his life and just believe him, and Nicodemus is not prepared to do that. I, I would draw your attention before we move on here, verse number 12. And Jesus says, if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Earthly things here is just, this is normal analogous language. Uh, Jesus has, has just used natural things to convey spiritual truths by, by virtue of the fact what it means to be born again. Uh, he, he's using uh, regular notions, language that Nicodemus should readily understand, but he is failing to make the connection from the physical illustration to the spiritual understanding. And so Jesus says, if you can't understand this at an earthly level, how would you hope to understand this at a spiritual level? If I was to just talk straightforward with you concerning heavenly things, if you can't get the lesser, you're definitely not going to get the greater. Jesus is simply highlighting for us the impossibility of a person to believe outside of the operation of God in their life, even a man as highly esteemed as Nicodemus was. So let's, let's move on to the second thing we want to see tonight from verse number 14, and that's the plan, okay? Uh, the, the plan is this. 
and, and, and there's no disconnect here, okay? There's no break like Nicodemus walks away and Jesus begins speaking to another crowd. This is still the same conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. And so Jesus, uh, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And so in this verse we see uh, Jesus is informing Nicodemus of what God would do to give a person access into heaven, okay? In other words, if we were to get into the theological ramifications of this, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, uh, all of the sacrifices that you guys are participating in, uh, currently they are not good enough. Uh, Jesus, or, or God is going to do something bigger than that. All of those, and we understand this, all of those other types uh, or all of those other sacrifices and religious ceremonies are but types that are pointing, they are lesser and they are pointing to the greater and ultimate sacrifice that God uh, would eventually make. And that's what Jesus is highlighting for us in verse number 14. And he compares this sacrifice, this lifting up of the sun to this lifting up of the serpent by Moses in, in the wilderness. Okay, so so, so track with me here, okay? If we were to back up from verse 14 back into verse number 13, previously here in verse 13, Jesus has, has conveyed to Nicodemus, no one has ever ascended up into heaven. In other words, not one person has ever gone up into, uh, into heaven of their own will. No, no one has ever accomplished uh, that feat by themselves. But, he says, uh, the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And, and the idea here is no one has a right to go into heaven as it is set right now. But the Son of Man has descended. He has come down from heaven to earth in order to accomplish something that would allow mankind to be able to go up into heaven. Okay, And I believe personally outside of men like uh, Enoch and men like Elijah uh, who, were, who were taking up prematurely into heaven, uh, which are they are an exception to the rule. The general rule is when an Old Testament saint died, he, his, his spirit did not go up into heaven into the presence of God but it actually went into a place called paradise, or in Luke chapter 16, Abraham's bosom. No man has yet uh, the right uh, or the merit to enter into the actual abode of God, which is why the Son of Man, Jesus, has descended to earth to accomplish the mission that would allow captivity to be led captive from the underworld into the upper world, uh, so that now Paul could say we are confident uh, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That wasn't a truth, a reality for Old Testament saints, but that is a reality for New Testament saints. And and Jesus has come down to accomplish that mission. Well, how is that mission going to be accomplished? That mission, Jesus says, was for the Son of Man to be lifted up from the earth. Okay, now we understand that the expression to be lifted up is a euphemism for crucifixion, okay? This isn't like if we pump Jesus up, <laughs> okay? This isn't charismatic, this isn't jam to the lamb uh, kind of stuff. This isn't, you know, raise the roof for the Lord uh, or or whatever, you know, folks do uh, in, uh, in, in certain places, all right? This is... This is him being lifted up, not in praise, but being lifted up as a sacrifice once and all, uh, once for all, uh, for every single person that would believe. That's the mission, okay? So, that mission is typified or illustrated by, uh, again, an Old Testament uh, event. And that event, Jesus says in verse, side of verse number 14, is as Moses lifted up the serpent. Okay, you remember that, uh, the, the story actually takes place, Numbers chapter 21 and verses 5 through 9. We're not going to take the time to read that tonight, uh, but the, the nation of Israel had, had adamantly just refused to trust and obey God. They are living in, 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 uh, definite rebellion against God. They are not believing Him and they are not obeying Him. So as a result of this, in punishment, God is going to cause venomous snakes 
to swarm into the camp and bite them. In fact, the Old Testament calls them, remember that, uh, fiery serpents. You talk about a nightmare. For years, I, I thought it was like snakes on fire, okay? Uh, you know, you, you have the movie Snakes on a Plane. Some of y'all seen that, okay? Yeah, uh, others of us are very spiritual individuals. And so, you know, you're deathly scared to get on a plane because what if there are snakes on a plane? What do you do? Uh, but, but, but now, you have snakes on fire. Uh, well, that's, not, that's not the idea. Probably, more, more than likely, it was their bite that caused this inflammation and it felt like you were on fire from the venom actually penetrating going into your uh, bloodstream. And so God sent these fiery serpents into the camp and, it, and they started biting uh, all, of these, uh, all of these Israelites. Well, as a remedy to that, God instructed Moses to take and, and make uh, construct a, a bronze serpent and to take that serpent and to lift it up on a, on a pole, on a, on a staff to, to elevate it. And, and when, when you were bitten by the, the fiery serpent, the only hope you had that the venom wasn't going to take your life was to simply come to uh, the serpent, lift it up in the wilderness, and look up to it. Now, there was no saving efficacy in the, in the material, the, the brass, the bronze. Uh, there was no saving efficacy in the serpent or in the imagery there was no saving efficacy in the staff or its location. The saving efficacy was in the faith that it took to trust God and obey Him, or if you will, take Him at His word. And so Jesus says, as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, God, God told Moses to make the bronze serpent and lift it up on a pole. And as he did that, um, and as folks looked up to that, in trust and obedience to God, they were immediately, not processionally, but they were immediately cured from the venomous snake bite. This incident was used by Jesus here to depict the actual gospel message that Jesus came in like manner, or if you will, in fulfillment of that type in the Old Testament. Jesus comes to be the actual fulfillment of that as He is going to be lifted up in similar fashion as the bronze serpent was lifted up on the pole. Except this time, we are not lifting up an inanimate object. We are going to be lifting up the only begotten Son of God. We are going to be lifting up God in the flesh. He is, he is the remedy for those who have been bitten by sin and infected with its consequences, okay? And so that brings us to the last thing that we want to look at tonight, and that is the possession in verse number 15, okay? So, so you have the perplexity how can these things be? Jesus answers, how can this actually be accomplished? How could a person actually enter into the kingdom of God? By what merit could they do that? And the answer to that question is only by the blood of the crucified one, only by the Son of Man who is going to be lifted up in similar fashion as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. That is the merit by which a person may come in to heaven. But, but how, how is what Christ, how is what the Son will accomplish, how will that be accounted for me? How, how will that become of a benefit to me? Okay, so verse number 15. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so, so Jesus is kind of sticking with this illustration of the bronze serpent. If you did not look at the bronze serpent after you were bitten by the fiery, venomous serpent, you perished. There was no other medicine. There was not a hospital with an anti-venom readily available. Uh, if you didn't look to the serpent that was raised up, you would perish. In like manner, Christ says, whosoever believeth in the Son who will be lifted up, such a person will also not perish, but this time not physically, but such a person will never perish spiritually. Indicative of the truth, he will have eternal life. Now, there's something more to this illustration uh, that Jesus has given to us, and it's, and it's simply this, okay? 
and, and I need you to really grab a hold of this, okay? It was not enough in, in Moses' day. It was not enough to simply lift the serpent up. Um, I, I guess we could say it like this. There was no universal application for the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness. It was simply not enough. Those infected must look to the serpent if they were to be saved from certain death. Okay, I, I hope you see the connection this evening. Uh, it is uh, the same way with us, that those of us who have been affected by the poison of sin, it is not enough that Jesus simply has died on a cross. There is no universal application for Jesus' death on the cross, okay? Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. We know that. In fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy, just as God had promised He would. And yet, there are countless numbers of individuals who have, who are, and who will continue to die and go straight to hell forever and forever and forever because it simply is not enough that Jesus died on the cross. You must believe. You must, um, in Moses' day, you must look to the raised up serpent. You must trust God's remedy. You have to take God at His word. Now somebody in Moses' day, an Israelite in that day, may have said to themselves, I don't understand. Who cares? I can't make sense of all of that. Nobody said you had to make perfect sense out of all of that. Look and live. And, and as soon as you look, you are cured. It's as simple as that. What's, what's that look like for us? Well, I, I, I love this still in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number 22 a text that was instrumental in bringing uh, the uh, famous Charles Haddon Spurgeon to faith in Christ. Isaiah 45, verse 22, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. How does a person come to be saved in the New Testament? Okay, uh, how, how can this happen? Well, really... Two, two things here. Number one, Christ must die on the cross to merit our salvation because we could never pay for our own sins. But in addendum to that, the individual must believe. Again, verse number 15, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. The word, the word believe here is translated from word that, that means to have faith in. And, and the, the nuance here is, is that it's, it's indicative of dependence. Okay, and, and again, you see that in, in Isaiah 45, verse 22. God says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. When a person looks to Christ for salvation, the, the distinction of superficial faith versus saving faith is that the person who believes savingly on Christ has come to the end of themselves. They're not saying it is my works with Christ or it is my baptism with Christ or it is my church membership with Christ. There is no one else. There's no other remedy. There's, there's not, there's not another serpent. There's not a, there's not another brazen animal. There's not another method where I can be cured from this venomous snake bite. There's only one way. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, there's only one way. You have to believe, which means you have to junk everything else and come to Christ. It's not Christ plus the mass. It's not Christ plus a, a, a rosary. It's, it's not Christ plus an offering. It's not Christ plus 
plus anything. It is Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, for the glory of God alone, as revealed by the Scriptures alone. This is what it means to be saved. And so, and so such a person has to come to the end of themselves. They can do no more and no less than trust the fate of their undying souls to Jesus Christ and submit to His ultimate Lordship over them. And a person must do this or he will never enter into the kingdom of God. Now here's the dilemma and, and we're going to be finished. The dilemma is that Nicodemus couldn't do that. And he couldn't because he wouldn't. Okay. The the conversation doesn't end here. It, It goes to the famous verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Modern preachers, 20th and 21st century, have, have focused more on the, the terms whosoever than they have on the real issues at hand. They tried to define, they tried to either limit or to enlarge who the whosoever's are. Let me, let me attempt to settle the debate. Okay? If God doesn't supernaturally do something in your life, it's not just that you couldn't come to Him and believe, you wouldn't come to Him. And believe. So the whosoever's in these, in this ultimate passage is really, uh, is really inconsequential. Okay. Uh, because you wouldn't. The, the, the conversation continues. Uh, verse number 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already <coughs> because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Okay. Here's, here's the reason why for such a strong stand that light is come into the world and men, generally speaking, universally speaking, men love darkness rather than light. That, that's not a statement of men love sin more than they do righteousness. That's equally true. But in verse number 19, it is men love ignorance rather than the truth, rather than knowledge. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds... Here's the idea of wicked behavior. Because their deeds are evil. Men do not naturally live right. Therefore, they do not want exposure to truth. They would rather live in darkness or in ignorance. Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hates the light. Watch this. And he does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. It's not that Nicodemus necessarily couldn't. I believe he couldn't, but there's something larger at stake here. He would not come. He didn't desire to come. Nicodemus by himself was comfortable with his own level of religiosity like every other person in this world, whether they're atheist or agnostic or a preacher behind a pulpit that's been unconverted for years. People are comfortable with their level of religion. Every man has created a little g-god to suit themselves and they think, I am fine the way that I am and I don't need what you have. I preach to hundreds of people every year that sit there and and they dare me to tell them they need something more in their life because they're comfortable. What hope does such a person have? Well, the only hope they have is the same hope that Nicodemus has. That God would grant them the new birth. That God would that God would make alive their spiritual faculties so that they could really see the predicament that they are in. That's the only hope that a man has. He must be born again. And if he is not born again, he would never come to the light to believe. And so you and I have a song to sing through the rest of our lives and throughout all eternity. Unto Him who loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And we'll sing praises to Him throughout all eternity at the exclusion of singing about our own abilities because Jesus paid it all. Let's stand this evening for prayer.